Great. So I'm going to introduce uh, the Recover project, and then Jeff is going to show how what we're actually doing in 4CE uh, ties in directly to like what we want to do in Recover, and hopefully, you know, we'll proceed that way. And so, um, let me just begin with. Um, <laughs> The recover comes from, see the R, C, O, V, E, and R in recover. And what this is, is it is a project trying to make sense of long COVID syndrome, which, uh, you know, many of us, of course, are invested in here. And Congress actually uh, provided $1.1 in funding over four years for the NIH to, to, to study uh, post-acute syndrome of COVID. And so part of that, went to this new program called Recover. And uh, the Mass General Brigham got one piece of that. And um, basically the, the initiative is to identify factors contributing to post-acute sequelae of COVID and COVID recovery. It's to characterize the effectiveness of pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions. It's to unravel causal mechanisms between infection, post-acute sequelae, and other outcomes, and understand how demographics, both clinical and social determinants of health, might modify the intervention effects and biological mechanisms. So it's a very complicated uh, set of objectives that need to be studied because, as we've talked about extensively in this conference, there are many factors that uh, influence recovery, and they're certainly not all biological. And so it's important to kind of be able to find and understand those factors when studying something uh, this complicated. Now, recover is organized as an observational study, and we haven't talked about observational studies yet in this conference. We've talked about using the electronic medical record and other kinds of data that uh, from um, uh, rehab hospitals and so forth, right? But we really haven't talked about, now I have to say, Kavi talked a little bit about it because some of the data that we get from the Indian studies is going to be collected directly in a similar kind of observational way, but through nurses and doctors, okay. But <laughs> recover is basically where you uh, specifically are going to ask patients very targeted questions about their course in COVID-19. And there are protocols designed to ask those specific questions. And those include looking at that protocol in adults, in pediatrics, and in people who have died, perhaps from past, but perhaps from something else and had past. And that gives you, of course, opportunity to look at tissues and so forth like brain. There's over 50,000 participants and that will include people in the acute phase of COVID, the post-acute phase, and of course, uninfected control. More than 250 clinical sites across the US will be uh, collecting clinical cohorts for this study and asking those patients all of these questions. Um, there will be a central red cap instance that's developed and housed by the DRC. And the DRC is what um, I'll show you in a minute what Mass General Brigham is doing with Harvard Medical School. And um, a lot of the complex data modalities that we're going to talk about are all going to be integrated, and that's going to be done by Harvard Medical School and Mass General Brigham. And so here's kind of the basic uh, layout of how the different cores work. So the NIH is the head of everything. It's a OTA. It's actually a, not a grant. It's a kind of a contract, but not really. Uh, the NIH has a lot of say in exactly how things are organized and work. Um, there are two basic cores, the clinical science core, which runs all the clinical cohort sites, all 250 plus of them, and the data resource core, which gathers the data and analyzes it and determines things like what's the sample size going to be and what's going to be sufficient to uh, attain a significant result and so forth. And then Tied into that is a biorepository core, which will collect all the samples, as well as autopsy slides and, and, and so forth. So lots of tissue 
You can see there's uh, extensive number of cohorts across the country. Each of these might have subsites, uh, all adding up to the greater than 215. There's adult cohort sites, pediatric cohort sites, uh, sites that are for pregnancy. Uh, there's uh, seven autopsy national sites and three EHR cohorts national sites, one of which is N3C, and I think we'll have a talk by them, maybe not on this, but, uh, but they are part of this big project that NIH has launched. And just to give you a good flavor from exactly what happens, you might be like, really? They're going to collect all this data by hand from patients? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and that's why, you know, there's 500 million, right? Because um, they do, they, they have to collect these data by hand. There are very, very extensive uh, forms that are created in REDCap that either uh, the research assistants will actually ask patients questions when they're in clinic, or the, the surveys will be mailed uh, to the, emailed to the patient and they'll fill them out online. But we're talking about over a thousand questions, for example, on the adult cohort over time. And you can see there's a, this little, little demographic down there shows the organization of how the uh, forms are kind of presented. And it's just to give you the sense that this is a longitudinal project. Every three months or so, there will be a new form that the patients will need to fill out and that different kinds of data will be collected. Just to give you a sense, so all of this gets compiled in the uh, Data Resource Core, the DRC, and uh, Nitch Wadhanasan has built this I2B2 ontology browser, and it does actually host the data that uh, is going to be collected in this uh, observational cohort. And so you might say, well, this doesn't look like EHR data. This looks like questionnaire data. And the answer is yes, it is. Um, but questionnaire data, if you really kind of think about what it's doing, it's collecting important data elements, which are probably also present in the electronic medical record. And so in a way you could say, well, that's kind of duplicative, but I just want to give you a good sense of like the questionnaire and what it looks like. So here's a question on fatigue. Obviously, you know, fatigue has been a symptom that we've shown and, and, and needs to uh, be taken very, very seriously as a post COVID um, candidate for uh, something called myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome, which is spurned on uh, unfortunately, by COVID-19 and affects our people very severely. Um, we think that um, a good 10% uh, or so of people are affected by uh, some kind of post-COVID uh, symptom and fatigue is one of the most prominent ones. Um, we have to, of course, compare these things and be very specific, specific about the questions we ask and the kind of fatigue they report but as well as compare that to the controls, the uninfected, right? And understand where, where the two lie. Now, once you've built an ontology of all of these results, you can then also collect the data, which occurs um, in the EHR, mobile health devices, imaging, and so forth. And that complements it. That complements this clinical cohort data very, very much in that it can fill in missing participant data. It can continue to collect data from participants who are lost to follow up. And of course, collecting new data on participants that was not originally collected because we didn't know that this was going to be a factor. But later on, we decide, let's say that, uh, you know, your hand turn, turning red <laughs> is a factor. We never collected that. Well, then we can go back to the EHR and our other studies that complement the, 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 the uh, clinical uh, observational data to fill in and, um, and complete it. But in another direction, which is perhaps even more critical, is this idea that we can take observational data, let's take, say that fatigue, right? And we can compare that to part the participant survey data and call that gold standard data, right? Call that gold standard data. And then the Clinician collected study data can be compared to the EHR data to validate phenotyping methods. So this is like a, a mega study, if you want to think about that, about it this way, just to collect gold standard data for our EHR studies. And that way we can establish specificity and sensitivity of widely used EHR concept sets. We can understand disparities in EHR data across diverse communities which have low access to healthcare, perhaps. 
And we can really get a handle on the truth in the EHR data by comparing it to what's in the observational data. Now, both of these have their limitations. Observational data that gets collected by hand is not as far from perfect, and we all know EHR data is far from perfect, but the errors that are present in the two types of data are quite different. And therefore, having them both complement each other and kind of validate each other is a really innovative and novel concept, which some of us, of course, have, would, would say, well, we've been doing this for years when we phenotype patients, but now it's being done in an enormous way, if you want to think about it um, in, in that form, with studies like this and studies going forward. Now, you might say, well, is that actually going to work, right? Because I'm really just conceptualizing this. The first patient was recruited in October of this year. So we haven't really collected a lot of data, and we certainly haven't done any of the EHR data comparisons. So what do we have to go on? Well, there's a MGH acute COVID hospitalization registry that was collected during COVID-19. It's a retrospective registry. It was collected by hand on COVID-19 admissions between March and June of 2020. And then it had all these manual annotations, which we fit in the exact way we're talking about to the EHR data. And here we have five symptoms. Uh, anosmia, trouble smelling, cough, dyspnea, trouble breathing, uh, fatigue, and headache. And you can see that we can get a good handle on just how accurate and uh, specific uh, the, the EHR data is. And so if you're looking to specificity, you can see that you get a pretty good specificity from using the um, ICD-10 codes that we find. The problem is the sensitivity, you can then see, is terrible in the EHR, right? It's only 1% sensitivity for uh, anosmia, and they're all pretty low. And then you can see, well, if we enhance it with natural language processing on the notes, it gets considerably better. And so at the end of the day, when you calculate the F1 scores on the ICD-10 or NLP put together, you can see you actually get pretty good results. And so what we can see here is that we know now from comparing the observational data that got collected to the EHR data exactly what to expect in our EHR in terms of specificity and sensitivity. And we have the opportunity to enhance our methods in the EHR, just like we've been doing for years with phenotyping, but it's just doing it in a really big way. Now, all of this, getting kind of to David Creed's philosophy here, right? All of this is a way to put together the I2B2 Transmart community and doing that to support the learning healthcare system. And so that we're really looking to have these clinical studies embedded within patient clinic visits, just like we're doing in Recover, right? With algorithms then to improve healthcare data quality and EHR explainability, right? Explaining AI and the way that we can derive EHR results enhancing our clinical data then with genomics and imaging and device data and other things that can be used to augment the data in a, in a well-determined fashion. And here you can see that by doing this in one patient, you can actually take those results and multiply them to numerous patients across the medical record system. And so therefore we can obtain truthful data, right? On our EHR patients, because we know we've compared them against the gold standard in a large number of patients. And that's really the key to being able to understand the true characteristics of our patients and lots of the very important but not well-documented in the EHR characteristics. Often the data is in the EHR, we just don't understand where it is. And by having these comparisons of what we collect by hand versus what's in the EHR and working with them both together, we uh, can actually determine exactly how accurate the data is in the electronic medical record and in our studies. We can go even further by saying, by characterizing each individual patient this way, we can actually provide something called an agent, right? And this has been something that's really been propagated by John Holmes in his work, where they actually provide the method to simulate the interactions with incredibly complex interactions, right? That we have between patients who they're, who they're you know, coming in touch with and spreading disease to, who then their um, 
uh, gaining other factors from, and you know, some of our patients become depressed and how do you distinguish depression from fatigue and so forth. It really can be done by looking at this analysis of individual patients and the interactions between those patients. And that's really a critical thing that we can then kind of uh, uh, gravitate or, or graduate to um, in, in doing these uh, really complex studies where we know a lot of data about each individual patient and therefore what kind of data in the HR can be used to find those kinds of outcomes in our patients. All of this can be, is actually uh, being performed. Uh, so the Enclave enables the computation of the digital twin of our patients, which then allows us to assess them even in, in real time. And so in summary, this idea of an Enclave, which by the way is what um, we're kind of focusing in on in, in, in India with Kavi. And one of the points Kavi was making was that they really kind of need this idea of an Enclave housing the data because as all of our data is, it's very private, right? And so um, we're very lucky in 4CE to have the, the broad um, aggregate data to be able to share and understand, but a lot of the outcomes need to be done, you know, in a very private fashion inside enclaves and so forth. And that's kind of where many countries have gone and of course the U.S. as well. Um, but it can develop the learning health care system, system using that kind of developed uh, 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 computational environment automating the flow of data to a broad set of analytic endpoints. Um, modeling the digital twin in the enclave demonstrates many of the analytics developed in Recover and 4CE and Picture and uh, Transmart applied to the real world. And these models can be ported worldwide. And that's exactly what we were looking to do in, 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 in India. Of course, all this takes a village. I can hardly do justice to all the many folks uh, who have been working, you know, to, to make this a reality. Um, I point out, you know, uh, of course, many Kavi and, and, and Griffin and uh, 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 Victor and, and many of those on this uh, 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 conference are uh, part of this. And now um, Jeff is gonna present how developing a gold standard can actually um, fuel things in the way we just discussed, but has been doing it for 4CE. So I will stop sharing and let Jeff proceed. Thanks. Let's see. Uh, so I think I have about five minutes, so I'm gonna keep this on the short side. And what I really wanna do is just talk about the, the critical importance of having this gold standard, the, uh, the chart review. And this ties back into 4C a little bit, but it's, a, it's an active example of what, what kind of power you gain when you add this custom data of, of information that comes uh, not directly from the EHR, but from uh, chart reviewed data. Uh, so the problem that we're trying to solve is that uh, our, our metric for including a patient in uh, 4CE is they're considered a COVID patient if they were hospitalized with a COVID positive test, which, which sounds intuitively great because that is how you know if someone has COVID. But actually, a lot of people get, um, get COVID without any symptoms. And anyone who touches the healthcare system in any way gets a COVID test these days. So we started seeing as the hospital systems opened up after the first wave that patients were going in for routine surgery like for a knee replacement, and then they were uh, they were getting a COVID test, and they were being labeled as COVID positive as a COVID patient, even though they weren't being treated for COVID at all. And worse than this, uh, we developed this phenotype for disease severity in COVID um, that uh, focuses on things like mechanical ventilation and vasoactive medication infusions, but those are not things that you only get if you have COVID. So people who were you know, being treated for an asthma exacerbation were getting labeled as having severe COVID because they got an epinephrine injection. Uh, so the strange things are happening that are subtly like throwing off the research conclusion as things that we weren't even really thinking about. Um, so we need some way to detect whether a patient is actually being hospitalized for COVID or just happens to have a COVID positive test and is asymptomatic. Um, some examples of things we've actually seen in looking at charts from patients. Um, patients that were considered COVID patients had heart failure exacerbation, trauma and shock, substance abuse, knee replacement. So which of these are COVID related? 
Um, we've spent a lot of time discussing cases like these uh, a few months ago. And I, I think what we, we generally felt like is heart failure exacerbation could certainly be COVID related, but a substance abuse hospitalization or a car accident, probably not COVID related. And then these patients were getting labeled as having severe COVID, um, pneumonia, probably COVID, intracranial hemorrhage, possibly COVID, but an asthma exacerbation, don't think so. And a C-section, certainly uh, COVID can cause labor complications. So it could be related, but not, not definitely. So we're trying to develop methods that uh, use the chart review to find proxies of whether a patient was actually admitted for COVID to improve our uh, research ability with both severity and just general questions. Uh, I'll go through this. Two minutes? Okay. So this is this is a Sean, uh, Sean, slide that Sean came up with, actually, but it really highlights the, uh, the importance of this. If you look at the average um, IL-6 levels among the, this is all hypothetical, but among the patients labeled severe by our algorithm, you get, um, that's the bottom where it says without correction, you get a very similar average for severe and not severe. But if you filter it out where you ignore the patients that were admitted not for COVID, but for accidents or for pregnancy, then you get a much higher signal where the IL-6 levels are, are certainly elevated. And that's the kind, of, the kind of thing that we really are trying to accomplish. So we did a, a lot of chart review. We got, we've gotten a lot of participation from uh, several sites, four sites that you can see on here. And this is really the power of a network uh, that it engages and engages individual sites like 4C, like Recover, like N3Z, all these, all these networks really engage the individual sites. And that allows the engagement of uh, going back into the data and looking at patient charts. And, and we spent a couple of months coming up with chart review criteria that would be simple and straightforward for people to use uh, to review charts quickly so they could annotate which patients were actually hospitalized for COVID versus not. And just very quickly, this is the, kind of the, the initial, the first, the result of this first phase, which is the chart review. We found that of patients who came into the hospital with a COVID positive test or got a COVID positive test shortly after being admitted, only 69% of them were actually dealing with COVID disease and a full 26% uh, and this is this is an average over all of 2020. Uh, so this is not just during one of the waves. If you look during the waves, it's it's a different story, the first and second wave. But many, many patients were being admitted for uh, trauma or scheduled surgery or full term labor or drug toxicity that uh, that were not COVID related. This is this is kind of this is. Uh, what it looks like by week, but this is just chart reviewed patients. So you see at the beginning at most of these sites, patients that come into the hospital are being admitted for COVID. And then as more patients come into the hospital, um, as, as the wave wraps up, then patients are with COVID positive are not always being treated for COVID. And then again, you see an increase in the second wave. And then patients again, after the second wave are not being treated for COVID necessarily when they have a COVID positive test. So the fun thing you can do after you've gotten to this point, and I'm gonna skip over most of this because I'm running out of time, but you can look at what are the kind of the proxies in the data that approximate whether a patient was admitted for COVID. And it's not necessarily what you'd expect. We're looking into um, using this technique called hospital dynamics that looks at kind of the metadata about the hospitalization rather than specific order sets and, and laboratory values. Uh, so one thing we're looking at is just the presence of certain labs because a patient might get orders like procalcitonin or D-dimer if, if their physician thinks that they're dealing with COVID. Um, and that's, that's what all we're looking for. So we're just looking at kind of presence and absence of things in the hospitalization. And we're hoping, and we're starting, we're seeing that this might be true from starting to analyze the data across sites that you get much more resilience across heterogeneous sites because you're not looking at very specific things that are kind of tied to the ordering practices of the hospital, but just uh, just kind of the general general markers for uh, concern about about COVID disease. Uh, I'm going to skip over these last two slides, and uh, and and I think I'll skip over the takeaways since I uh, 
I've, I've kind of hammered that home in the last five minutes, but it's, it's an exciting project and it also really highlights what you can do with chart review and kind of things that we hope to be able to do further in 4C and in Recover with, with chart review. So I'll stop there. I know we are over time. Uh, and... There was a, a question in the chat. Uh, about how do you consider hospital-acquired hospital um, COVID-19 patients? Oh, uh, I haven't looked at them specifically. Uh, pa patients that are, get hospital-acquired COVID are labeled as 4C COVID patients because they did get a positive test um, after their, within a few days of their hospitalization. And there is a criteria in our chart review uh, for uh, does the patient was the patient not initially admitted for COVID, but then was dealing with COVID. We haven't, um, I think we did label them, but I, we haven't, I haven't looked at them separately as a subcategory, but, but we, are, we are aware of that. And, uh, and so we do have that kind of catch all thing that if they weren't admitted with a COVID disease kind of thing, but you see something that discharge summary where they were clearly treated for you know, viral pneumonia or something, then that, that, is, uh, that is included. Andrea, do you have a question as well? Yes, yes. Uh, I have a question that I think uh, is more for Sean uh, rather than for Jeffrey. But uh, you mentioned this uh, this huge question that was submitted to the uh, to the patients. Um, my question is: Is this only in English? Because uh, I think that a, a, a great bottleneck would be in, in the because at the end you mentioned that it's it's quite easy to port this uh, uh, around the world but you know if you speak with if you address the patients and uh, the passion they can speak um, uh, other language uh, other languages rather than english how, how do you think how do you think to Andrea, explore this that's a great question and and certainly you know the more languages the better although as you know you know getting the nuance can be tricky so you need a good translator um, we are doing it in spanish because a lot of the folks that were because studying oh, I also Spanish. thought that yeah. yeah that you have SNOMED uh, uh, that there's already aligned so you may have already some terms you know at least at the level of summary that I I see now you, with, with these keywords I mean so right. in, in a sense that you can already had already have uh, some languages aligned. Right, right. We it, it does take some effort, but yeah, Spanish. We are we are definitely um, putting it all in Spanish. Um, and I think you know, it's when when all of it gets very solid, it would be our pleasure to release this into you know general. Um, I'm I'm sure the NIH is going to insist that we release it into open source, and then it can undergo uh, a lot more translation. So that's a great point. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, in case, I uh, just wanted to mention that I developed a tool to tr automatically translate medical terms from different sources in, into a desired tar target language. It seems to work well. So hmm. in case, remember about me. Thank you, Andre. I, I may you, send you uh, the first uh, publication about this, and then you can have a look. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll remember that. I just got a screenshot to make sure I remember. <laughs>